Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to the Cage Titans lightweight champ, Joe Gianetti. Joe, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, no problem, man. How you doing? Good, good. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good day here in Raleigh, and I'm glad to be connecting with another guy from the Bay State. Yeah, any day, bro. Um, it's really cool, actually. A lot of people locally have been hitting me up lately, so it's, I didn't know there was that many people that did like sports podcasts, so it's really cool when you guys uh, hit me up. Yeah, it's awesome. I think it's cool, too, to to connect with the audience too. And like people that watch my show are probably more inclined to like go out to an event too, if it's in Plymouth or wherever a local locally and stuff like that. Like recently um, on the fifth, you came off a title defense, Jacob bone um, is a great victory. Tell me all about it and uh, how it went down and how you feel. Uh, it was awesome, man. You know, I, I wasn't feeling the best on fight night. It was just one of those things. Fight camp was kind of a mess, but we, you know, we got the job done. The fight happened. And on fight night, you know, I was in California training. So we joked about coming home to the cold, but, you know, warming up in the locker room before the fight, it was tough to stay warm. <laughs> um, and I did eventually get warm, but it was like too soon. So I ended up cooling off again. And then, you know, when I went out to the cage, I was feeling a little stiff and a little slow and I was kind of in my head. So I kind of just was like, all right, we're going to go to the center of the cage. and We're just going to brawl. I knew my instincts would take over. So I was like, if we brawl, I know that I'm going to win this 10 out of 10. It won't be exactly the cleanest fight like I normally like, but I know I'll get my hand raised, and that's all I cared about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the difference in the climate. Like I mentioned before the interview, I go to North Carolina State, and a few weeks back, we had about two inches of snow. Governor Cooper declares a state of emergency <laughs> shut down on Friday night. Uh, it starts snowing a little bit, and all these drunk kids that have barely ever seen snow were like running around, <laughs> rolling in the snow, making snow angels, trying to go down tiny hills on cardboard boxes. I mean, they have no idea. <laughs> they have no idea because I go, you guys have no idea. Back home, there's like 24 inches of snow. There was just a blizzard. Yeah, it was. It was bad. It was bad. The roads were terrible. Yeah, yeah. So you come back. It's these kind of atrocious conditions, and then was it just? you know, adjusting to the travel and stuff that made you not feel tip top on fight night? Or is it just sometimes that happens when you're a fighter? I mean, what, what do you think caused it? Um, the whole fight camp was kind of a mess. So like going to California and training at AKA is like super expensive. And, you know, last time I did it, I did it for eight weeks. This time I did it for like three and a half weeks. Um, and then my first week out there, I got a staph infection. So I missed out on a majority of my camp. So in total, I actually only trained for the fight in the gym. Like I trained at the, at the uh, weightlifting gym down the street, but the fight gym, I only trained nine and a half days. Oh. So it was more mental than anything. And then come fight night being cold. And then it was just kind of like, felt like everything was stacked against me as I was walking out. Um, and that's, like I said, that's why I just had to kind of shut my brain off and just get in the middle of the cage. Yeah. And MMA is one of those ruthless sports and it's, it's got some upsides to it because that's the way the fans and the fighters like it. But if you were in any other sport, you know, Rogers with his COVID toe, you could have told people, Oh, I'm going through the staff infection and everyone would have felt bad for you in MMA. It's, you know, you can't make excuses. You have to be just ready to roll. So when you got in that cage, right. Um, and you decided, well, this, this is, I just have to fight and instincts will take over, you know, what was the, the experience like round to round? If you can sort of break down what the first person experience was like. Uh, after the first round, I knew I made the right choice. I felt, you know, I knew that watching the fight back, I wouldn't be super happy. And I'm not, like I said, my fights are usually cleaner. Um, and it was a little bit messy and brawl and there's blood, but like in the moment I knew I was doing the best I could with how I felt. I knew that, uh, I was winning the rounds. I knew that eventually he would fold and break and he did. Mm -hmm. um, but I was able to sense that right off the first round because I think it caught him off guard how I fought. It caught the fans off guard how I fought. And it was still wearing away at him. And I have a big ass head. I knew if we're brawling, you're going to have to hit me perfect to knock me out. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that's awesome. And then the finish was like spectacular because you got him in it. It was just you could tell. It, he was so tired because you'd been piecing him up all night. Um, and one thing I want to point out, because I heard you talk about it in other interviews, um, his record is deceiving because he has had um, some tremendous performances. He's a strong, tough fighter. And he even beat the former uh, Cage Titans uh, lightweight um, champ in a different promotion. And so that was a little bit of your motivation going into this one, right? Because you, even though you'd won the title in the um, vacancy fight, you really wanted to solidify it by beating the guy that got the guy. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, you worded it perfectly. Ever since he beat the former champ that, you know, he just wouldn't fight me. 
I was looking at Bond every time he fought. I didn't know if we'd ever end up fighting, but I wanted that fight. I wanted, like you said, I wanted to beat the guy who beat the guy. Just so when people look and they're like, oh, well, Joe never fought, like never fought the champ for the belt. It's like, okay, well, the champ wouldn't fight Joe, but Joe <laughs> beat the guy who beat the champ. Yeah. So like, that's the second best thing, if not better. Um, so, you know, it would have been great to beat them both, but I can only control what I can control and beat who they put in front of me. A hundred percent. And like you touched on how your own style came out and surprised a lot of people. Was there anything from Bond that you were, you know, surprised by or that you weren't expecting, whether it was his style or just what it was like fighting him? Uh, honestly, the only thing that we didn't see coming is he didn't wrestle, you know? Um, and I think he learned this fight, like why guys don't like to stand with me. Um, even my previous fights where I wasn't really striking much. And people say this all the time recently, like, you know, oh, you're more aggressive on the feet. You're striking more, da, 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 da. All my fights that I've won on the ground, if you really watch it, I've landed at least one clean left hand. And then it's a grappling match, either by my choice or by theirs. Mm -hmm. But almost all of my opponents have told me that I hit really, really hard. And, you know, I have guys in sparring that are like, oh, you don't really like hit that hard. I just don't like to spar hard. Mm. But a majority of the guys that I fought, if you've seen me land a clean left hand on them, they've said, you hit really hard and I didn't want to strike with you anymore. And that's what I've tried to explain to people for so long. And now it's one of those things where I'm not accepting the grappling. I'm not accepting the wrestling. I'm like, if I decide to strike, we're going to strike. And this is going to be a bad time for you. Wow. And, and, you know, we kind of were surprised that Bond was willing to, to walk through that fire and he wanted to strike with me. Uh, I, like I said, I knew it would have to be a perfect shot for him to put me away on the feet. I was weary of his wrestling the entire time. Um, uh, yeah, we were just surprised he didn't wrestle. I think that that would have been a better chance for him is trying to wrestle, but I don't think it would have worked out either way. Yeah. And so that's, what's interesting too, is, um, there's a lot of respect for you in the ground game as well. You've got finishes all over Dars, rear naked arm bar, um, basically everything in the book. But you're saying you're shifting more towards the striking and you're relying on sort of that, that powerful left hand. Uh, I'm not so much relying on it. I, I'm just, you know, it's one of those things where these guys on the ground nowadays, like I hate to say it because it, it's a lot of guys that can't wrestle say this, but as somebody who's working his wrestling every fight camp and is getting better and better at wrestling, I can honestly say that these guys don't try to take people down and they don't try to finish and do damage. They try to take people down and they try to get side control and lay there. Uh, you know, one of my losses in LFA, I remember there was 15 seconds left. The whole fight, I was on my back trying to get this guy off of me. I had got hit in the face twice and there's 15 seconds left. And I was like, okay, I can't get up. He's super strong. I'm going to give him mount. And when he tries to hit me, I'll try and get up. I give him mount and he's fully mounted on me. I'm like this and he doesn't try to hit me. And so I start yelling at him. I'm like, hit me, hit me. My corner's yelling, yeah, elbow him, hit him. And he just laid there. And I'm just like, you have your opponent and his coach is telling you to hit him. And there's not even a guarantee that I would have gotten up. I could have just eaten some elbows to the chin. But like these, these guys just come out and they want to get on top and they want to hug you and they want to hold you. I don't want to see that as a fighter. I don't want to see that as a fan. Um, and so it's one of those things where like, if somebody wants to wrestle and grapple with me, I'm more than happy to, I will gladly choke you out or I'll get on top. If I get on top of you though, it's going to be bad. I'm going to be trying to do damage. I'm going to be trying to hurt you. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where my striking has always been good. I just never let it go. And now I'm just like, screw it. Let's let it go because I'm, I'm so confident in my wrestling and my grappling. I can just hurt people anywhere. Yeah. Well said, well said. And that makes a lot of sense. And also, to your point about like, even as a fan, not wanting to see that, like the hug fest on the ground. Um, I'm certainly no expert on MMA as my sports betting record can attest. <laughs> but uh, I, as someone that's been, you know, pretty into MMA for a few years, I kind of don't like when that happens for too long, but I know that there is arguments from people that are purist about like the grappling side of things hey you got to let this happen do you have any any hot takes on like at what point a referee should stand guys up if there's you know not as much action happening on the ground I think a lot of referees just need to have grappling experience I think if you're experienced in grappling you'll be able to watch and like because I have experience in grappling and I can see it in a local fight live or on tv I can tell you when a guy's trying to either advance to a better position go for a sub set up a sub or do damage I can also tell you when he's going, okay, I'm really tired. It's been a tough round. I'm going to hang out for a minute and win the round. And I get it because there's an argument here and there. Like my last amateur fight, 
I got my ass beat on the feet. The guy beat the hell out of me. And I was trying to strike with him. I just, at that point in my career, couldn't. And so I was taking him down and I ended up winning on the cards. I took him down a bunch that fight, but I was trying to do damage every time I took him down. And every time we stood up, I went for another takedown. But the point is, is I'll go for takedowns if I feel like that's my best route to success. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to finish you. I'm trying to do damage. Like we're in here to fight. And a lot of people make the argument like, oh, it's my paycheck. So I'm going to do what I have to do to win. And I get that. Mm -hmm. But every fight, like, like I said, one of the guys that I lost to at LFA, I think he's 10 and two now with one finish. Like it, it's, it's just not what people want to see. And I get it's about winning. I get it's about the paychecks. Trust mm -hmm. me, I'm trying to make a living too. But it's also an entertainment type of sport. And I think if more refs were experienced in training, they would know, oh, he's setting up an arm bar. Oh, he's trying to advance to mount. So then he can do damage. Or they would know, oh, he's tired. He's just trying to hold him. That's when refs need to stand guys up is when the intent isn't to do damage. Yeah, that, that's um, a really interesting way to put it too. And I hadn't considered that, that if the refs had the experience, um, I've heard it definitely made it. I'm sure you have as well with the judges, people saying we need people that have had in the cage experience judging so that they know exactly what the fuck is going on when they see mm -hmm. it when they're watching it but yeah that's an, a good a great argument about the refs too that they'll be able to see what exactly is getting set up um and that makes sense one thing i would be remiss if i didn't ask you about um on the topic of grappling is training at aka um khabib Nurmagomedov. obviously he's a, a stud right out of there what's it like you know grappling with him miserable uh, he's so, he's so strong and he's so good. He's so technically sound. Um, he is the, the greatest lightweight of all time for a reason. Um, and he's an even better coach, which is what a lot of people haven't realized yet. Um, you know, he pushes everybody so hard and he gets in on the training, you know, he's a lot bigger now than when he was fighting, but he still gets in there. He'll do the grappling rounds, the wrestling rounds, like no matter how tired he gets, like he's in there, he's getting us tired. Um, <laughs> So, and that's another thing that I make the point of to people, like I'm training with these guys. So like when I come and fight, it's like, I'm so happy that I'm not fighting one of my training partners. <laughs> <laughs> like they kick my ass every day. I get in the cage and I'm like, oh, it's just this guy. Thank God. Yeah. It's not Islam Makachev in the. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not staring me down. Like he's going to kill me. I'm like, oh, this is so much better than sparring last week. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. That's crazy. So he. As a coach, too, you think his, his skills are on par with himself as, as a fighter. What is what is his leadership style like as a coach? Um, he just, you know, I think I never got to meet his father personally. But mm -hmm. from what I've heard in the videos I've seen and the way everybody at AK talks about it, he just runs a ship like his dad did. It's just everything is like, listen, you want to be good. This is what you got to do. And that's it. I don't care how hard it is. Point blank. Like we need to train this, this and this, whether it's your wrestling, your grappling, certain mm -hmm. techniques. But it's like, there's no gray area. Like, and he's very good, like, about listening to your body. You know, if this is hurt, that's aching, then don't train. Recover, come back stronger. Mm -hmm. But if you're healthy and you're able and you need this, you know, the biggest thing I see with fighters, myself included, which is why I go there, is certain fighters need work on their wrestling. Okay, well, we're wrestling. We're working A, B, and C. And there's no gray area. Like, I can't, I don't want to. And he'll just push you. And he's always trying to get guys to be better. And I think he probably has a higher standard considering how good he is. Mm. Um, but a lot of fighters struggle with coaching. You know, that's something, you know, I do private lessons with people all the time. And I tell them, I go, this is practice for me just as much as it is for you. Like I'm practicing to teach people because I know all this stuff, but I'm trying to display it in a way that you can understand. And some fighters can't do that. I think I'm decent at it. I think Khabib's great at it. Wow. Wow. And that, I love that point you made about the coaching and how it's practiced for the coach too, because I, uh, I was not, not even a very good D2 uh, javelin thrower, but I was a D2 javelin thrower for two years. And when I went and coached high school, I actually got a paid gig like a year and a half ago. And I had to break it down to these high school students that had this lower, you know, beginner to intermediate level of knowledge. When I came back to school and I was with my college coach, I realized that I had jumped up in my own skills and my own knowledge by having to realize, like, teach it and break it down and understand the intricacies of it. And coaching is so valuable in that way, even for uh, someone practicing something. Yeah, the amount of times that I've taught something and I've, I've just gone over the basics of it, at the same time in my head, I'll be like, oh, I don't really do that when I do it. Like, I got to remind myself to do that little basic thing. Like something as finishing a take, simple as finishing a takedown, 
if I'm just like, oh yeah, then you turn your head this way and you, and you cut the corner and I'm like, I don't think I've been turning my head when I shoot. I'm like, I got to do that more often, just like I'm telling them. So it's like, you know, I get reminded of the simple little basics when I'm teaching people. And when I'm at AKA, I run one or two uh, classes a week, whether kickboxing or MMA, just like, you know, beginner and intermediate, but it's the same thing. I show basics and I'm like, oh yeah, I got to remember that when I'm training. Yeah, very cool. And another uh, legendary coach that I'd love to ask about would be DC over at AKA. Um, he's like almost like Kevin Hart or, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, where it seems like he's everywhere. Literally, and I, I have a buddy who was like, oh, yeah, DC was at the NC State uh, wrestling uh, match at PNC Arena. I was like, oh, fuck, I missed him. Like the dude, the dude is everywhere. Let's, what's he like as a coach? Yeah, he's all over the place. Uh, he's been super busy lately. You know, he also has his own wrestling academy in California now. Um, I actually got to train there the last two times I was there, but I didn't see him this last time because he was out. But uh, as a coach, he's awesome, man. And he just, he cares. And that's the biggest thing is like, you know, even on the ultimate fighter, like he didn't know any of us and like very well, couldn't have ever talked to any of us again after the show, but he cared about all of us. He gave us all an open invite to AKA. He was like, you want to come down, come down. You don't, you don't. Um, but yeah, you know, he just takes you when he's your coach, he takes you under his wing fully. And, you know, I've been to, his high school wrestling practice when he coaches there and he didn't like, he didn't get paid or he did get paid, but he gave all the money to the other coaches. Like he's wow. like, I don't need, he's like, I don't need the money. He redid the whole wrestling room for them. Uh, he re revamped the high school wrestling program. So it's just like, he did that for those kids. Like he did that. So they had a better opportunity. He just cares as a coach. And that's one of the biggest things. Wow. And it's so cool for me as a fan too, to, to hear someone that, you know, you watch the videos on YouTube and you listen to the commentary and you see the good, the, the articles about him. And so you want these things to be true, but you never quite know as someone just as a, a passive observer. So it's so cool to hear that over at Gilroy, he really is the man and he's doing all just all these, you know, acts of kindness that aren't even out there like that to hear it from someone like you that knows him. Um, and on the topic of the ultimate fighter, I actually remember um, watching your season. I think it was pretty awesome. Uh, I was wondering what is the, biggest maybe misconception that the fans have about the realities of the ultimate fighter, or at least, you know, with the show being condensed like that, what kind of things as just myself, someone watching at home can't, you know, do I not see about what's going on behind the scenes or, or what you guys do? Um, it, the biggest thing, like I say to people all the time, I use, I don't know about anybody else. Uh, I don't really remember like how they were portrayed more so, but like I tell people all the time, the producers from that show do such a good job and making people look a certain way. I don't know about whether good or bad, but for me at least, like, I can't explain how boring I was when I was on that show. <laughs> you know, like I was walking around so light. My diet was so strict. We were training so hard every day, twice a day. All I did was eat. I would cook food, eat, go train, take a nap and repeat every single day. And somehow they got like all these clips of me doing stuff around the house. Like, just like everyday stuff that people think is interesting, but I'm like, you guys don't realize how boring I was. Like, I remember uh, before, you know, they do, they pull you aside and they, they want to get your take on like your upcoming fight and stuff like that. Um, I remember one night they said, I didn't wake up. They said before my semifinal fight, they came into my room. It was only like 8.30 and I already had dinner. I went to lay down in my bed and I was out cold. They said they came in to try and get like a word from me. Like, what do you think about your fight? This, that, and the other thing. Yeah. And they were like, you were out cold. And like, we tried to wake you up for like 20 minutes and you wouldn't wake up. Like we got concerned at one point and I was like, oh no, once I'm out, that's it. It's a wrap. Like, <laughs> better luck tomorrow. I was like, you guys missed the opportunity. And they were like, yeah, we were like concerned. You didn't even twitch. And I was like, I'm a wicked heavy sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Well, you did. You were like the man on that show. You and I'd say uh, Bryce Mitchell. Uh, and then obviously like a John Gunther was like, so yeah. lovable. you're like, this dude is just like, he's yeah, like, Gunther was was a man. Cheap, cheaps or something. Uh, alpacas. Alpacas. You're just like, this guy's like the man. Like, I don't yeah, know. No, no, Gunther was the man. And, uh, that was like a big thing. Like everybody's always, what's it like fighting somebody you live in the house with? Like as soon as me and Gunther got announced to fight, I was like, I don't want to know him. I don't want to talk to him. Like I avoided him the whole time. Just like, you know, cause we, we got a problem now. Like I don't like you for the next week yeah. and then we'll be cool afterwards. And we were like, as soon as we fought, you know, he was bummed. He didn't really talk to anybody for like a week or two. And then he started opening back up and he was a wicked cool dude. Um, you know, I remember, I'll never forget my favorite memory of him is, is probably a week or two after we fought and we're, we just happened to all be making breakfast at the same time. And I'm cooking my eggs and he's like, and think somebody got hurt. And so like the spot was going to be open towards the end of the competition. 
And he's like, yeah, man, like, I'm just going to keep training hard. Like, I hope I can get my spot. And he's like, I never really got a chance to fight and showcase what I can do. And then he just slowly looks at me and I was like cooking my eggs and I didn't realize. And I looked up and I was like, are you guilt tripping me right now? <laughs> I, I was like, cause it's kind of working and I feel bad. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't you you caught him in like a, a guillotine and like the 30 seconds in or something? Yeah, it was like 17 seconds. But uh <laughs> but he like I just hit him clean, but that was another opportunity. I hit him with a a hard left out the gate and then a left uppercut and he shot in. And I just caught his neck. And uh yeah, he was like guilt tripping me and giving me shit for it. It was actually <laughs> it was actually pretty funny. But you know, the kid was a super hard worker, you know. He would wake up, he, I remember he tied an apple to a branch outside. He was like working head <laughs> movement like shooting double legs on a tree and we would all joke around like one day he's going to take that tree out and we're all going to be like <laughs> a true lumberjack yeah it takes their tree <laughs> down holy shit but yeah that's such a weird aspect everyone's fighting even even dc and stipe are like gearing up like two grown men gonna beat each other's ass at some point i mean yeah and dc like as as nice of a guy as he is and as genuine as he is he knows how to get under people's skin and he was kind of picking on stipe all season like not like like picking on him, but you're just trying to be like his buddy, and you could tell Stepe didn't like it. <laughs> wow, what what kind of things? Just like just like, hey man, how's it going? How you doing? Like being super polite to him, but like you could just tell by Stepe's face, he's like, how's it going, man? What's up? And DC was like, oh come on, like just trying to be his friend. And yeah, Stepe didn't like it. I saw an interview after they fought the first time that he was like, yeah, I couldn't stand that dude. And then you know, DC beat him in uh, the ice hockey challenge. Who he could barely stand up on the skates. <laughs> And I know that that got uh, Stipe pretty pissed. I don't blame him because DC sucks at skating. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I'm not surprised because DC is such a smart guy that he just would know how to crack everyone. And it's funny that that's the way to get under a guy like Stipe's skin. It's to be wicked nice like that. And just, you know, because other people, it might be getting in your face. I mean, like a Chael Sonnen has that same ability to just like act like a maniac. Have you well, it's funny because it's genuine. I don't even know if DC knew he was getting under his skin. He was just trying to be like buddy buddy with them. And I think Stipe was like, dude, like we're fighting, like get away from me. Oh my. <laughs> oh, okay. So he was just being DC. He was just being a nice guy. Yeah, he was just being a nice guy. But like, you know, I don't know. I could tell that like DC because Stipe was cool. He, he was nice. He didn't get mad or anything, but like you could just tell he was like, oh, kindly please get away from me. Yeah. I, I saw in another interview you were talking about there's a few like shit talkers that when you get to the UFC, you'd love to fight them. You personally, is that not your style? I know you mentioned you're more blue collar. Are you not trying to be the shit talker or do you think that there's a time and place for it? And that if you see a guy that you want to have words with, you'll have words with them. Uh, I'm all for shit talk, but it's gotta be genuine. Like I'm never gonna, you know, if there's a guy that I want to fight that I've never met, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, you know, you suck. Like your, your team sucks. This, that, the other thing. Yeah. If we have a mutual beef or if you said something about me or my team and I have a reason, I'll shit talk all day. You know, Ooh. me and my buddies shit talk each other just for fun. Um, but I think it's just super corny that some of these guys are just like, oh, I'm, I'm boring and I want to be noticeable. So I'm just going to talk smack. And it's just like, you know, and I used to do it like earlier in my pro career because I couldn't get fights. I had a tough time uh, before the Ultimate Fighter and after the Ultimate Fighter getting fights. So I was just picking names on a list and I was like, all right, we're going to talk shit about him today. And we're going to talk shit about him today. Yeah. You know, then I lost a couple and now everybody thinks I suck and wants to fight me. And I was like, cool, I don't have to talk shit. anymore. <laughs> these, these guys will just fight me. Um, so now that that's like a thing, yeah. even now is like, luckily I'm still able to like get these fights. Hopefully we can keep it up. Um, you know, I, I just don't feel the need, you know, I, I like to be genuine. And that's why, like I tell people all the time, like whenever I make a mistake, like you don't need a, a freaking media article you don't need a facebook post because i promise you, you can go to my profile i'll be the first one to be like hey i fucked up mm. like there's just people are gonna know people are gonna find out so i'm just gonna own up to it because if i say oh i didn't do anything well the facts are gonna come out no matter what mm. so i'm just gonna own up to it and move on there's people that that harp and live on my mistakes and it's like buddy i'm sure you've got plenty of skeletons in your closet that you haven't even looked at mm -hmm. yeah and the one thing about mma fans that i've definitely noticed is they're very fickle and they'll sway with the wind. Like mm -hmm. think about like the Bengals, right? Going to the Super Bowl. There've been some miserable fucking people in Cincinnati that have loved the Bengals for 30 mm -hmm. years, lo losing, losing, losing. And now they're getting their chance and they've stuck with the Bengals. I don't know how many MMA fans can stick with someone for decades or throughout their whole career sometimes, but there's people, you know, uh, the perfect example I always like to see is like 
Masvidal. They'll love Masvidal, then they'll hate Masvidal, then they'll love him again, then they'll hate him like, you know, and it's with a lot of fighters, they, they go back and forth. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a weird thing that I think is a little bit unique to MMA where the fans will like completely flip on one person one minute. Yeah, I forget who it was. I, I want to say it was, I hate the guy, but I want to say it was Stephen <laughs> A. Smith. Um, but it was somebody up there, but they were talking, they actually talked about this topic. And, you know, it's something that I think about all the time that I don't think MMA, MMA fans think about. You know, Steph Curry plays with the Warriors and, you know, they lose Monday night and he only scored three baskets. And you're like, damn, Steph, like you suck. Like you need to go to another team. The whole team sucks. Like they need to start worrying about their roster. Well, then Wednesday night, they blow out somebody by 56 points. Steph Curry's got 40 of the points. Like, oh, Steph's the man. He's a killer. Like the roster, they're taking the whole thing. Like that can ch- that changes every day for like an, a basketball team or an, an NBA player. Whereas like a fighter, you know, I think they were talking about TJ Dillashaw. You know, he comes out and he gets knocked out by Henry Cejudo and then he pops for the EPO and now he can't fight and redeem himself for three years. Well, the next three years, everybody's like, yeah, TJ sucks. He's a cheater. He, he got knocked out in 50 seconds. Like he's the worst well that's what sucks about all mma fights forget injuries or anything you know if you go out and get knocked out you can't fight next saturday and redeem yourself that's what people think of you for the next two three four months until you fight again and that's why people are always like you're only as good as your last fight um and you know you you end your career on a losing streak that's what people are going to think of you unless you're a diehard that's like oh no remember for the 10 years they were undefeated (laughs) yeah that's such a great point too about the time to redeem yourself uh, and it kind of that factor kind of compounds when you consider it's not the same as missing a bunch of three pointers. You're getting beat up. I mean, anyone that's even been in like a schoolyard scrap knows like as soon as you're lined up, like the most embarrassing thing is to get like beat up in front of like a bunch of people, whether it's 10 people or like, you know, 100,000 people on a pay-per-view like that's, you know, that that's another fact that sucks. Yeah, everybody like you know everybody knows what it's like to to put a basketball in a net. Not everybody knows what it's like to get punched in the face in front of a hundred thousand people. <laughs> like the way I explain it to people, it was, just with my luck, you know, I lost on the Ultimate Fighter finale by split decision. It was a very poor performance on my end. Some people like, oh, you should have won, whatever. Win or lose, I wouldn't have been happy with that performance. But it turned out to be one of the biggest UFC fight weeks in UFC history. Mm. So. You know, the card was free. It was the day before pay-per-view. Everybody's watching it. The whole place was sold out. Like, I had the biggest, uh, like, opportunity for eyes on me and absolutely airballed it. But the difference is, is nobody's going to pass me the ball in the next play and I get to shoot again. Like, yeah, I, that's it. I got a couple months before I'm even in the public eye again. That's all you think of me for the next coming months. And where, like, Twitter is such, like, the fastest social media – they yeah. just, you know, hashtag your name and then you click on your name and this is what we 50,000 people think of you. Yeah, that's a crazy thing, too. And I've never had an experience like that. Um, hopefully soon I can get my podcast big enough that someone will want to cancel me or something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell we- you what, that was the hardest part after the finale is like, like hashtag Joe Janetti, you would go under it and you would just see some vile shit. Like mm. people just like hate their life and they're like, you know what, let's just make this kid feel fucking terrible. And it worked. I felt absolutely miserable. Like people were saying some terrible shit that I was like, what does that even have to do with the fight? (laughs) (laughs) Like, what the hell? But like now, and then like the problem too is like leading up to the finale, it was the opposite. I had so many tweets like, oh, you know, 17 second guillotine. And then he beat the shit out of this kid in the semifinals. Mm -hmm. I was like feeling myself. And then that rug gets swept out from under you and everybody's flipping the the script. I'm like, ah, I don't know anymore. But now it's like, I'm so confident in myself and what I'm doing. I know my mistakes. I know what I need to get better at. Like when people post positive stuff about me, I'm like, that's cool, but it doesn't do anything for me. I'm not like, hell yeah. Like I'm the man. You're right. It's like, no, that is cool. And I do appreciate it. Like it took me a while, but having fans is like a cool thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, some fans will get butthurt if I'm not like, Oh, you just made my day. But like, Mm -hmm. I have to be like that because if you're, if your positive comment makes my day, then somebody else's negative comment is going to ruin my day. And I'm not going to let that happen. Right. So it's like, so it's like good or bad. I'm cool with who I am. I appreciate the good. And if you're out there and you're just like, I need to say something bad about this fighter. I'm sorry. Your life sucks that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Like If they're performing poorly, you could say something, but like, like I said, some people will just go out there have nothing to do with the fight. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's important to note too. Like you said, you can't get swayed with the wind, the good, 
um, or the bad. You can't let that control your mindset or anything about that. I love the, if you could give it again, I don't know if this is something you say, it sounded like it was something that you maybe thought of, but in an other interview, you kind of explained how <clears throat> it was like the pool analogy, how you got to the, yeah, why don't you give it? I thought it was, it was well said. Uh, I, I, it was a couple of weeks ago, if I remember correctly, but yeah, when you get to that deep end, mm -hmm. was that the one you were talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. I forget how I said it, but, uh, it, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, you, you can't just dive in. You just, you got to work your way there and you got to be ready for it. And if you're not, it's, it's going to be a bad time yeah. mentally, mentally and physically. That's the biggest thing is mentally. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I thought, oh, well, this would be a good question for him was you said some guys your dream has always been get to the UFC and be successful. Some guys just want to get to the UFC and then they're there. They win two, they lose two, they're out. And you say, Hey dude, you didn't even try to go to the deep end. What do you think in your opinion, does it take to get to the deep end? What does a fighter need? Um, so I'm glad you asked this because I wouldn't know how to vocalize it until I saw a video last week mm -hmm. and I don't know who she was. It might've just been a random girl on TikTok, but the way she said it was, for you to get your dreams and everything good in life all depends on how much you're willing to live through the exact opposite. Mm. So if you're willing, so if you want, you know, to be a UFC champion, to make millions of dollars for everybody to love you, how long are you willing to go through being a nobody with no money that nobody gives a shit about? And like, I saw that and I was like, damn, because like, I'm willing to go through the shit. And I always have been. But something that, you know, it strikes my mind every once in a while is like, how long am I willing to go through this? Like, it gets to a point where it's like, what do I have to show for all the hard work, all the sacrifice, all the wins and the losses? Like, what do I have to show for that? And I think that's the biggest thing is some of these guys, they, they're like, oh, I would totally do that. Like, I don't care if anybody knows my name. I don't care if I have money for like three years. But after that, I should be in the UFC, like with millions of dollars. Mm. And it's like, no, buddy, like this, this is a, this is a lifetime thing. Like my whole thing, when I was on the ultimate fighter and even before I used to tell my friends all the time, I'm going to win the ultimate fighter. I'm going to run through the UFC. I'm going to get the belt. I'm going to defend it once. And I'm going to be retired by the time I'm 30. And now I'm like, I'm 26. I'm not in the UFC. I don't have any money. Like I'm the cage Titans champ, which is cool. But on the grand scheme, like MMA fans, I'm a very small fish. How long am I willing to go through this? And I had to, after I saw that video, I had to sit down and think about it. And I was like, I will go through this as long as I have to, if I get what I want at the end. Mm. Yeah. And that totally, and I, I just have the smallest little taste of, of that struggle. Like you said, going and like, like that you've had struggling and pursuing a dream, but it totally connects to what I do where, you know, I started the podcast in uh, June of, of 2021. I did like for three months, I did some interviews with some high school athletes and a few college athletes. And I go, I did like maybe 40 or 50 interviews. And I go, that's great. I go, now I'm ready. I'm going to make this a big podcast. So I'm only going to interview big D1 athletes. I had a few BC basketball players on. So I was like, I'm only going to do these big interviews. And then, a, you know, a month later or something, I realized, well, well, who am I to think I'm too good for this or that interview? So what I did was now in I've done another hundred interviews. I'm at like 140 and it's almost all been like local Massachusetts high school basketball players. Because I realized if I actually want to be like a Joe Rogan, a great interviewer, I have to be willing to do hundreds upon hundreds of interviews. So while some people might think, Oh, that's like a smaller interview that what's that going to do. I'm refining and crafting my skills so that when the day does come that I'm ready for some big interviews, I'm the guy that's ready. I've put it in the work. And so even like this one with you, I mean, you're probably maybe the biggest interview I've had. I interviewed Peter McNeely, you fought Mike Tyson too. That was a cool one, but I've been sharpening my skills. If I had just fucked off and waited six months and hadn't done any interviews so that, and then I got one with you, I probably wouldn't have been as ready to converse and to hit you with questions and to respond and make an interesting conversation. So it's like anything you want to pursue. You have to be able to go through some of that. Um, you, you have to be humble in the beginning and work your way up. Yeah, for sure. And like, you know, one of the other big things too is, um, is just enjoying the process. Like I said, I'll go through the miserable stuff as much as I need to, as long as my goal is at the end. Mm -hmm. If my, if I never reach my goal, if you know, the money, if the millions of dollars in the, in the UFC belt isn't for me, I'm going to make sure I enjoy the process in the middle so that, you know, at the end of my life, towards the end of my life, when I'm, I got grandkids and they're asking about what I did, it's like, 
oh, I actually used to get in the cage and fight people, and I was pretty good at it. I wasn't the best, but I, I did my best. Yeah. And they'll be like, damn, like my grandfather's a badass. But you know, some of these people are just like, like, no, no, I want the goal. I want that thing. And it's like, okay, well, you're gonna get it. And then eventually it's gonna mean nothing, whether that's you know, a UFC belt and then you retire. Once you retire, I guarantee you won't care about that belt. You know, I you I don't know if you've ever seen the video of Mike Tyson when they're going through his house and all of his championship belts, and they're like, This is amazing, these are awesome. And he picks it up and he's like, This doesn't mean anything. He throws it on the floor. And the guy was like, what are you doing? He's like, all of this, these belts, this gold, this doesn't mean shit. He goes, this meant something when I was 19. This doesn't mean anything to me now. And people don't realize that that's going to come for everyone, whether when it's on your deathbed or the day after you get it. So it's like, you're going to have to look back and be like, wow, I spent all this time on something I don't care about anymore. So wow. enjoy the time you're spending on it. Yeah, that's like, yeah, it's going to happen one day for everyone, whether it's the deathbed or a day after. That's a great, that's a great way of putting it. And by the way, you will you are already like the coolest grandpa of all time. <laughs> it, like pe from our generation, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 21, you're 26. Like it's going to be, some people are going to be able to say, yeah, I'm Joe Giannetti. I, I fought dudes in cages and some people, grandpa, can I see a video of you? My friend's grandpa fought in cages. He's just like, yeah, here's me hitting the renegade and skinny. <laughs> this is what I spent my 20 doing. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. I'd rather, I'd rather the latter of the two. <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, so I guess I'll end up on my final question. Um, I was watching uh, the card on uh, Saturday with a bunch of my buddies from the rugby team. We just finished a tournament and we'd done well. So we we're all feeling badass and we had a keg. So we we're all going, Oh, if I was the UFC, if I was a fighter, I could do this. Oh, I should take a fight in Raleigh, something like that. Um, what would be your advice to, someone that actually is interested in getting involved in amateur MMA and where, where should they get started? Um, amateur MMA. I'll tell you right now, you can be the best striker in the area. It doesn't matter. Wrestling and jujitsu are the best base work your ass off, be better than yourself every day. Um, you know, and find a gym that cares about you doesn't care about itself. You know, I, I want to own a gym one day. I would like my gym to be successful. I would like people to be like, oh, you know, Jeanette MMA is a killer gym. They got killer guys. But that doesn't happen unless your gym cares about each individual fighter. And if they don't care about each individual fighter, then it's not the place for you. Well said. Joe Giannetti, thanks so much for coming on the Young Shakespeare podcast. No problem. Thank you for having me, bro. This has been a great episode of the Young Shakespeare podcast. So thanks so much to Joe Giannetti for coming on. Thanks so much to everyone for listening, watching, liking, subscribing. Please tune in to the next episode of the podcast.